Breaking news, a crisis is developing for the Purple House. A water chiller known as the Red Beast is terrorizing dialysis patients and Purple House crew alike with its dumping of paralyzing hot air and its frustrating lack of portability. However, a crack team of uni students known as the Thermal Regulators have their sights firmly set on ending this red tyranny by coming up with a solution that is more friendly and can chill or maintain water at 30 degrees Celsius. We will meet the thermal regulators live on air as they discuss the importance of the problem definition stage, the conceptual design phase, and how they tackled the two in hope of finally defeating the red beast once and for all. First up, we'll hear from Paul, who will discuss the importance of the problem definition phase. The first step of the engineering design process is to create the problem definition. As stipulated in Michael Schofield's week two lecture, the problem definition clearly defines what the problem is to be solved, who is affected by the problem and why we need to solve this problem. It also identifies the functions, objective and constraints, which defines the boundaries of the design process. An effective problem definition will provide the designers with direction as how, to, as how they should go about solving the problem. Going into a design project without a problem definition is like a ship heading into sea without a map. Without a considered problem definition, we are limiting our ability to provide the client with a solution that meets their needs. This will result in wasted time and resources. The problem statement also clarifies what the client actually needs rather than what they think they, they want. Furthermore, while the client statement may include unnecessary constraints, the problem statement ex excludes such restrictions and hence the problem statement is crucial to enabling us to explore the full range of potential solutions. Thank you. Xavier will be justifying the quality of our problem statement. Thanks, Paul. We believe our problem statement to be of a high quality as it states who is affected by the problem or need, what this specific problem or need is, and why we must solve this issue. First, we determined that needing to create a water chiller, a supposed customer requirement, was actually an unnecessary constraint. We also found that the need to dump heat into the wastewater stream was a misunderstanding on the customer's part and another needless restriction. Rather, they desire that extracted heat not be dumped into the ambient air, meaning heat doesn't necessarily have to be dumped into the wastewater stream. By clarifying the customer's requirements, our problem statement doesn't include these two unnecessary restrictions that would have otherwise limited the range of ideas we brainstormed in the conceptual design phase. Our statement uses the who, what, why structure outlined by Michael Schofield, and we identify the Purple House and Indigenous Australians as being those who are dealing with the problem. We conveyed what this problem is, which is that regular dialysis treatment must be provided without displacing Indigenous Australians from their rural towns, and that this treatment requires up to six litres per minute of water to be supplied to an RO machine at 30 degrees Celsius without extracted heat being discarded into the ambient air. As a group, we identified that processing up to six litres per minute of water and not dumping heat into the air were imperative constraints, hence why we included them in our statement. Supplying water to the RO machine at 30 degrees Celsius was also included as it is the primary function of our intended solution. As well as stating what the issue is, our statement identifies what is needed to address this problem. This is a solution that is low cost, easy to use, portable and relatively maintenance free. These key objectives were brainstormed using an objective tree and were crucial to include in our problem statement as they outlined the customer's desires. By stating that dialysis treatment is required because of malfunctioning kidneys, we also covered why we need to solve this problem. So in summary, by clarifying the customer requirements and including objectives, constraints, and functions in the who, what, why structure, we believe that we came up with a problem statement that defines the issue in a succinct manner and yet is free of unnecessary restrictions or ambiguity. I'll now pass on to Carly, who will discuss the importance of the conceptual design phase. Thanks, Xavier. The second step of the engineering design process is the conceptual design phase. Concept generation is a process where we create solutions to our problem definition. It involves all individuals inputting their ideas, which the team then builds on and modifies to form a diverse range of possible solutions. 
Concept generation is necessary to find the best possible solution that successfully fits the client's requirements, is feasible, and meets objectives and constraints. By generating a variety of solutions, we are able to think outside of the box and produce something that is potentially innovative and revolutionary. This in turn gives us the best opportunity to find the most suitable solution for our client. Effective concept generation is also required to prevent wasting time and resources on redundant ideas that do not serve the client's needs. According to the American Association of Mechanical Engineers, nearly 75% of the manufacturing cost of a typical product is committed by the end of the conceptual design phase. This highlights the need to consider many factors when generating concepts to prevent the rise of costs which could have been avoided. Tanika will now be telling us about the concept generation and valuation tools we used. Thanks, Carly. Our team used the concept generation tools of starbursting, brainstorming, pairwise comparison chart, and an evaluation matrix to aid with our discussion of concepts and solutions. Initially, we used starbursting to brainstorm questions in a systematic way. The questions asked by our team members were categorized into who, what, where, when, why, and how questions. This allowed us to fully understand the different aspects of the problem and contemplate different possible solutions. Using the PCC method, we were able to identify our main goals, which were low cost, easy to use, portable, and low maintenance. This allowed our team to then rank their importance in relation to the overall project and help us when determining which solutions are most suitable. Using the questions formed from Starbursting and PCC, we were able to proceed to brainstorming rough solutions to the problem to allow for a starting point. The team was given five minutes to individually come up with five ideas each to collaborate afterwards. Finally, we utilized an evaluation matrix to analyze some of the concepts we had generated by considering the objectives and constraints of the task. The use of an evaluation matrix allowed us to determine the most effective and suitable concepts for, this, for the problem. Our concept generation tools has allowed us to rank our solutions based on the objectives and constraints, which Paris will tell you more about. Evaluating concepts with the tools Tanika discussed, we also visualize them through sketches to help see which of our concepts are more suitable than others. With visualization, we were better able to communicate ideas that we generated to each other and therefore became better identifying the shortcomings or successfulness of our concepts, as well as giving us the ability to refine or redesign our concepts by annotating them. Here, I'll show you some of the ideas from this concept generation. Using an easy to obtain and reasonable material such as ice to cool the pre-treated water sounded great until we evaluate the high maintenance of removing and adding more ice throughout the day and the cost of creating more for the next day. This is also not an easily controllable solution. We thought of a more permanent fixture solution, like a ground coupled heat exchange pumping the water underground or sitting the tank on a heat conductive plate to take advantage of the underground temperature stability. And while solving the maintenance issues, these solutions had a huge cost of insulation as well as being too bulky for the client's needs. A less elegant solution we came up with had a middle ground of the previous solutions. We would insulate the water tank, opening the insulation to cool overnight and close it during the day to prevent the water's temperature climbing due to ambient temperature. This solution was found to be much more cost effective and required little active maintenance to be effective, although it could be bulky to transport with limited telemetry options. Lastly, we had a solution to tame the red beast. Designing a heat exchange system that connects to the heated air exhaust from the red beast and passes over the wastewater from the reverse osmosis creates an elegantly low cost solution and maintenance free solution satisfying both the constraints and objectives while utilizing the infrastructure already in place. And now back to Carly and why all this matters. Thanks Paris. To summarize, the first step of the engineering design process is creating an effective problem statement which rephrases the client's request and provides direction to the project. Then we have the conceptual design phase which transforms our problem statement into viable solutions. Our next steps are to evaluate and narrow down our solutions further so we can determine the optimal design for our client. 
That's all from the thermoregulators. Thank you and good night.